This video is kindly sponsored by Conflict of Nations, the free online game that lets you test out your military stratagem on a global scale. Take control of a country in the late 20th and 21st century and engage in epic battles in which you can fight up to 128 other players in real time. Conflict of Nations is all about grand strategy, allowing for a deep and authentic level of planning and integrated tactical execution, meaning that a single game can take several weeks to complete. As you fight for world domination, you'll be able to build and deploy all manner of units, including stealth strike fighters and nuclear submarines, your fingertips controlling the very best of modern battlefield technology. There are many different ways to play, from focusing on military might to economic excellence or even political proficiency, with you having the option to form lasting alliances with your neighbours. It's entirely up to you. Conflict of Nations places you firmly in command of your country. And my viewers are being offered an exclusive gift. Simply click my link in the description to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. This offer is only available for 30 days, so don't lose time. Thank you for listening and thus helping to make my videos possible. Now, let's begin. It was 1967 and a 26-year-old 2nd Lieutenant Robert Salis was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base near Great Falls, Montana. It was the early hours of the morning of the 24th of March, and he was on duty as the Deputy Missile Combat Crew Commander. His task was to monitor the status of the Oscar Flight missiles, a series of nuclear-tipped intercontinental ballistic missiles designed to defend the United States in the case of nuclear attack as part of the Minuteman program. It was a Cold War policy, one which was hoped would never be required. And yet, by the time the sun rose that morning, Oscar Flight had been attacked by foreign invaders, with Robert Salis and other military personnel claiming that those who had done the attacking did so via extraterrestrial aircraft, and had the capability not merely to take multiple nuclear missiles offline at the Oscar Flight launch facility, but to trigger a sudden no-go shutdown of silos at another site also with the military to this day unable to conclude how or why the strange illuminated craft were able to do so, and what this might mean for mankind's ability to defend itself against alien invaders. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. It is no small thing to say that the United States' nuclear capabilities were shut down by extraterrestrials. And yet, this is precisely what Robert Salis and many others stationed at both Oscar and Echo flights in the 1960s have claimed. According to Salis' testimony, recorded in his and researcher James Klotz's 2005 book, Faded Giant, he was underground in Oscar Flight's Launch Control Center capsule when he received a call from a topside airman. He, along with a few others, had seen strange lights in the early morning sky. When Salas asked him what kind of lights they were, he is said to have replied that they weren't aircraft. Rather, they had been making some strange maneuvers, zigzagging across the clear night sky, suggesting they may have been UFOs. Thinking that they were simply playing a prank, Salas thus told the airman to keep an eye on the lights and let him know if they got any closer, before hanging up and returning to reading his book. A mere minute or two later, a second call came through. There was, so an audibly frightened non-commissioned security officer relayed, a UFO hovering outside the front gate. It was like a big red-orange ball, so bright that it was hard to get a good look at it. The security officer was instructed to secure the site and phone command post. Meanwhile, Salas went to wake his commander, Lieutenant Fred Maywald, who had been on a scheduled sleep period. As Salas began to brief him, alarms are said to have sounded throughout the underground capsule. There was a problem with the nuclear-tipped ICBMs. A no-go light had appeared on the commander's console, stating that one of the missile sites had gone offline and was now inoperable. Seconds later, a second alarm went off. Another no-go and another inoperable missile. Within the next few seconds, some ten missiles were lost to a no-go condition. As Salas and Maywald scrambled to begin their query procedure so as to determine the cause of the missile shutdowns, the above-ground personnel rushed to respond to the security breach caused by the UFO. It was, however, already gone, somehow disappeared. 
The security team dispatched to respond were therefore directed to return to the launch control facility. In a written testimony provided by Fred Maywald some years later, two very upset young men wasted no time getting back inside. For certainly, whatever they had seen that night upset them so greatly that one of the men had to be released from further duty as a security guard. And so it was, in the chaos of nuclear shutdown, Salas, Maywald and others attempted to get the missiles back online. Salas has described in some detail the checklist procedure that they went through so as to determine that they were not operational due to some inexplicable reason. After all, power had not been lost and there was no other obvious fault or reason for the shutdown. Not only that, after reporting what had happened to Command Post, the men learned that the same kind of missile shutdowns had happened at Echo Flight, another nuclear-tipped ICBM site in the Minuteman program. And sensationally, it was claimed that in an eerie imitation of the events at Oscar Flight, a UFO had been seen hovering over that site also. All in all, the strike capability of nearly 20 nuclear missiles had been lost. In the aftermath of the inexplicable shutdown, a missile maintenance squadron had to be called in to get the missiles back online. In the end, they remained out of service for an entire day, with reports of UFOs once again plaguing the launch facilities. Indeed, many of the base's security guards were called to stand watch, with some, including airman Roberto Morales, later going on record to describe the strangeness he observed. It started getting dark on us, Morales reported to researcher James Klotz during a July 2001 interview. We were watching the lights in the sky. They would streak, and then they would stop, going back and forth. In the airman's opinion, they were not Air Force. The way that they were travelling was too erratic, too strange. In short, impossible. Fascinatingly, Morales' testimony can be said to match those of others present in the site. In addition to Robert Salas sharing how he was informed by topside personnel that the strange lights had been zigzagging and making other strange maneuvers in the sky, an anonymous military technician has revealed that he not only witnessed UFOs in the area while the missiles were being brought back online, but that the strange light craft had actively interfered with the process of reactivating them. At this point in the narrative, it must once again be stressed just how incredible all of this is. For indeed, not merely is it being suggested by several named and on-the-record USAF personnel that unidentified aircraft played a part in the shutdown of American nuclear missile systems, but that they were able to frustrate and hinder their reactivation for an entire day. And so, if one is to even begin entertaining such a sensational, far-reaching, consequence-producing possibility, it is absolutely necessary to analyse the evidence. And certainly, military personnel like Robert Salas would agree. So much so, in fact, that for the past 29 years, since his retirement in 1995, he has dedicated himself to disclosure, speaking publicly, publishing books and presenting records and documents. As recently as February 2023, he spoke with the freshly established All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, an office within the US Department of Defense created to investigate unidentified flying objects and other air, sea, land and space UAPs. On the phone with the office for two hours, Salas briefed them of the Oscar flight incident, revealing in a later newspaper interview that he went through all the details extensively, even providing them with 22 pieces of documentary evidence. Included within this would have been testimonies and written reports from the engineers summoned to the site in the aftermath of the 1967 shutdown. After all, they had been unable to identify any significant failures, engineering data or findings that would explain why the event occurred. In the words of Robert Kaminsky, the Boeing company engineer contracted for the Minuteman missile system, the happening was rare and not encountered before, with his team, made up of qualified engineers and technicians headed by scientists, spending a week in the field in order to assess and test all possibilities without significant result. And as if this wasn't strange and concerning enough, just as the engineering team began to prepare their final report, they encountered another oddity, a stop work order. 
According to Kaminsky, their Air Force liaison instructed them not to submit the final engineering report, as it had been decided that all further efforts on this project must cease. This, explained Kaminsky in his written testimony, was most unusual, since all of our work required review by the customer and the submittal of a final engineering report to the team's liaise, Ogden Air Material Command. Such can be said to be a perfect expression of this entire case, secrecy and concealment. In this way, it is not surprising that Robert Salas regarded his 2023 phone call with the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office as a milestone. After all, for all that he and others had experienced that March, the light anomalies, the UFO at the gate, the nuclear shutdown, he had never previously had the chance to tell his story to a government office. They had simply not wanted to know. More than that, he had been explicitly instructed never to speak of the immediately classified incident ever again, being made to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Because of this, it has taken many years, decades in fact, for the full package of information, testimony and documentation to come to light. The Freedom of Information Act was able to crowbar much of the information out of government hands, with the rest being supplied by military witnesses and whistleblower testimonies. Even then, there is still some measure of confusion as to precisely when and how certain things took place, with Salas and co-author James Klotz in their book Faded Giant being the first to admit the fallibility of human memory, when they stated that, because of conflicting memories, some uncertainty exists whether, in fact, the Echo and Oscar Flight missile shutdown incidents occurred on the same morning or on different days within a short time. Decades after the original incidents, with the clarity of time and declassification, it seems that there had indeed been a similar occurrence of UFO-triggered nuclear shutdown at Echo Flight, occurring a mere eight days before the Oscar Flight incident on the 16th of March. In a 2023 newspaper interview, Salas also revealed that he had learnt of 10 ICBMs being disabled under yet again identical circumstances in September 1966 at the Minnow Air Force Base in North Dakota. Because of this, Salas has been clear to say that, in no uncertain terms, within a span of six months, we lost 30 nuclear missiles to UFOs. Indeed, a now declassified Air Force communication document relating to the Echo Flight shutdown even went so far as to state that, the fact that no apparent reason for the loss of 10 missiles can be readily identified is cause for grave concern at this headquarters. Here, I would go even further. It is a cause for grave concern for all humanity. After all, not merely was the most advanced weaponry on Earth at that given moment shut down inexplicably and in a matter of seconds, not merely did numerous on-the-record military personnel see UFOs and light anomalies in the lead-up, occurrence and aftermath of both the Echo and Oscar flight shutdowns, not merely did civilians report multiple similar sightings, including of a large, fast-moving dome-shaped light in the weeks before and after the incidents, but some at the heart of the shutdowns, including Robert Salas, went on to experience further and far more intrusive extraterrestrial contact. By this, I of course mean abduction, that horrific place where all journeys seem to end in alien phenomena. Before we go any further, it is necessary to stress that Robert Salas, both in his writings and countless spoken interviews and podcast appearances, is a highly intelligent, highly eloquent individual with a strong inclination towards the facts. His books read like military reports. They are military reports, footnoted with extensive bibliographies and impressive appendix sections stuffed full of documentary evidence. His own personal experiences are therefore secondary. They cannot be footnoted, they cannot be evidenced via diagrams and Freedom of Information Act revelations. Even so, he has tentatively opened up about his abduction experiences, most explicitly in the purposefully penultimate chapter of his 2015 book, Unidentified, the UFO Phenomenon. He explains how he first became aware that he was being abducted in 1985, some 18 years after the Oscar flight incident, when he and his wife Marilyn were living in Manhattan Beach, California, with their two children. One night, he woke suddenly, disturbed by a light coming from their living room. The light was a strange colour of blue and seemed to be drifting into the bedroom. 
Silas recalls waking his wife, fearing that there was an intruder in the house. And yet, as Silas tried to get out of bed and confront whoever was in his family's home, he found that he was paralyzed. Not merely that, as he struggled to turn his head, arms and legs pinned in place, he saw that his wife had gone back to sleep. Helpless and stuck, it was at this moment that Salas allegedly noticed a figure in the bedroom doorway. It was dark and seemed to have a hood over its head. What happened next can, in many ways, be described as a typical, terrifying abduction experience. Salas recalls lifting off his bed, floating towards the window, then somehow through it, before finding himself in a craft. There, he was forcibly subjected to a painful medical procedure, which involved the insertion of a very long, needle-like instrument into his groin. Prior to insertion, he claims that he received some manner of telepathic message that it would not hurt. A reassurance which turned out to be a lie. The pain was, so Salas has explained, extreme. When he complained about it, it was then relieved. He does not know why they did this, neither can he say for certain that this was his first or only abduction experience. In fact, speaking with his wife about his memories in the years afterwards, he is as certain as he can be that they had more than one such encounter. In his own words, I have no doubt that I was taken, and I am not sure whether I want to know what else transpired during that encounter. It is easy to understand why. This is something that we encounter time and time again in abduction testimonies. Careless, callous, non-consensual behavior. We can and should criticize governments, US and around the globe, for the concealment of information regarding our planet and the possibility of extraterrestrial information. But we should not fall into the trap of believing that the other side is any better. After all, for an extraterrestrial race with such effortless nuke-nullifying capabilities, announcing their presence to a global audience should be utterly unburdensome. And so, why haven't they? Why instead do they, if all these testimonies are to be believed, prefer to lurk in the shadows, forcibly abducting people, removing them from their homes so as to experiment upon them medically? Considering Robert Salas's alleged abduction and the lie of a pain-free experience, they should be interpreted as either stupid, careless, or outright malevolent, or even a terrifying mix of all three. Let it be said. Technological advancement, the easy ability to shut down multiple nuclear ICBMs, does not equate with emotional intelligence. Telepathy is little more than a party trick. If all that has been covered in this video and others published on this channel is correct, we should be wary. We should be asking questions. This case goes beyond the military, beyond the United States. It affects us all. As Robert Salas rightly states in the introduction of his book, Faded Giant, in a free society, we all bear some responsibility for the suppression of truth. To that, I shall add that this is even more the case when the truth may be difficult to swallow. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please be sure to like and subscribe, not forgetting to click the bell to turn on all notifications so that you never miss an upload. Also, if you want more about this incident, I highly, highly recommend Robert Salas's books, which contain far more detailed information than I would ever be able to cover in one episode. Those are linked in the description, as is another video of mine on the broader subject of extraterrestrials and nuclear weapons. Finally, once again, thank you to Conflict of Nations for sponsoring this video. Don't forget you can click the link in the description to play free, choose your country, engage in epic real-time battles, and get your exclusive gift in order to fight your way to victory. Thank you again. Until next time, 